Hello, everyone. My name is Marshall Goldberg, and as a member of the Trudy Sundberg Lecture Series Planning Committee, I will be your host this evening. I'd like to start out with a hearty welcome to all of you for attending this event. This is the first Trudy Sundberg Memorial Lecture in what will be an annual series designed to promote civic engagement and lifelong learning while covering national and global topics of interest to the people of Whidbey Island. As some of you know, Trudy Sundberg was a beloved, unforgettable Whidbey Island teacher whose passion for education, literature, history, the arts, civic involvement, and politics touched many lives. Tonight's event honors Trudy's spirit and her memory. My sincerest thanks go out to all of you, the audience, and to the many contributors to the Trudy Sundberg Memorial Fund for making this lecture series a reality. This event is made possible in part by the support of the Snow Owl Libraries Foundation and by a grant from Humanities Washington, a statewide nonprofit organization which is supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the State of Washington, and contributions from individuals and foundations. For those who don't know him, Hedrick Smith is a renowned public speaker and author of several best-selling books. One of them, The Russians, has been translated into 16 languages and has been widely used in university courses. Another book, The Power Game, became bedside reading for a president and a Bible for newly elected members of Congress and their staffs. As a New York Times reporter, Mr. Smith was a member of the news team in 1971 that broke the Pentagon Papers story, which won him a Pulitzer Prize. In 1974, he earned a second Pulitzer Prize for reporting on the Soviet Union and its allies. Mr. Smith has also won two Emmy Awards for his documentaries on PBS's Frontline. Tonight, Mr. Smith will discuss his most recent book, Who Stole the American Dream? A detailed analysis of the growing gap in income and wealth in the United States, which began in the 1970s. And now, I have the pleasure and the privilege of presenting to you Hedrick Smith. I want to say what a pleasure it is to be on Whidbey. My wife is sitting here somewhere. Susan, can you stand up? Um, oh. Uh, I, <clears throat> I, I introduce her because we are neighbors of yours. Uh, some of you know it, most of you don't know it. We have a summer home on Orcas. Uh, we have uh, a family in West Seattle. Uh, we're excited that our granddaughter has just decided to go to the University of Puget Sound, coming out of high school. So we feel very connected to this community. So for me, uh, this is much more than just a talk and a lecture. This is a way of kind of connecting and communicating with neighbors. Um, we want to talk about America. I think Trudy would have wanted us to talk about America, to think about America. I want to use the election for a moment and talk about the election, but not about delegate counts and not about hyped convention scenarios. I want to use the election for a moment as an MRI on America. What does the election tell us about us? What does it tell us about this country? This has been a wild, shocking, turbulent, upsetting election to a lot of people, shocking. I can't remember as turbulent an election uh, in my experience as a reporter until I go back to 1968, half a century ago, which was a really in the midst of the Vietnam War. This is an election that has changed the norm of American politics. Normally, elections are fought on the spectrum of left versus right, conservative versus liberal, Republican versus Democrat. The axis in this election is bottom up, up, down, not left, right. This election is about a mutiny of common middle class Americans against the power elite. Okay? This is uh, small donors against super PACs. This is Main Street against Wall Street. This is the 99% against the 1%. It 
it's the gut issue in this election is inequality. But not just inequality of income, inequality of power. Inequality of who gets to decide what the agenda of the nation is. Inequality of who the politicians in Washington or Olympia and other places listen to. Inequality of who benefits most from our foreign trade agreements. Inequality of who benefits most from the growth of our economy. Inequality in the deepest sense there is. We're a deeply divided country in America now. Divided by money, certainly, the 99% and the 1%. Divided by power. And divided by whom we trust. Look what happened in the Republican campaign. A whole bunch of governors who were time-tested in office, in elections, supposedly knowing how to connect with the voters, got cast aside and cast aside pretty easily. Why? Because ordinary Americans today no longer trust what C. Wright Mills in the 1960 called the power elite. Let me repeat that. People don't trust the power elite. That is a very big part of what this is about. We're not just talking about personalities. We're not just talking about Trump and Sanders. We're talking about a phenomenon in which those two candidates have tapped into what is churning in the belly of this country, which is a deep-seated anger about the inequity of our economy and a deep mistrust and a disenchantment with what people regard as a broken political system. This is not an ordinary election. This is a very, very serious election. It's telling us something very, very serious about this country. You know, when we think of Washington, we think of a polarized, paralyzed power system. When I think of it, just to give you a light moment, I think of the uh, Peanuts cartoon that's one of my favorites. It's the one where Lucy sets up a card table in the backyard. It says, psychiatry, one cent. And you know who comes up, puts his penny down. Charlie Brown comes up, puts his penny down. And Lucy says to him, Charlie, before I can give you advice, before I can do therapy with you, I need you to think of life as a voyage on a great ocean liner. Now, there's some people, and they take their deck chairs up to the bow to look into the future where they're going. And there are other people, and they take their deck chairs to the stern, and they look back to see where they've come from. Which group do you belong to? Charlie thought for a minute. He said, Lucy, I'm having trouble getting my chair unfolded. <laughs> that, that is, I mean, the year after says that is what we think of when we think of Washington. They, they can't get their chair unfolded there. It doesn't matter what the issue is, right? But it isn't funny. It isn't funny to us. Let me share with you what John Gardner said. John Gardner was in the a Republican, it was in the cabinet of Lyndon Johnson back in the 1960s and later founded Common Cause. Before John Gardner died and before the 2008 financial collapse and the downturn, the Great Recession, John Gardner said this. We are treading the edge of a precipice here. Civilizations die of disenchantment. If enough people lose faith in their society, the whole venture begins to fall apart. He didn't say the party's going to lose the next election. He didn't say we're going to have a downturn. He said civilizations fall apart. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are in that sphere. The politicians and the pundits and the press and the pollsters love to look at ratings of whether or not the president is up or down, Republicans are up or down, Congress is up or down. We in the media, we're down right down there with everybody else, low rating. That's not really what matters. What matters is when they ask people's confidence in the American political system, it is at a low point for the last 40 years. A low point of the last 40 years. One poll that I saw said that 60% of the American people believe America is in decline. America is in decline. It's seen its best days. Our kids and our grandchildren are going to be worse off than we are as a whole country. That's a phenomenal judgment. It's a very perilous situation. That's what Gardner was talking about. And when I saw that, it took me back to some of the reading that I did in Oxford after I finished Williams. And I read 
uh, some of the material from Arnold Toynbee, the famous British historian who wrote a 12 volume history of the world, 6,000 years, 21 civilizations, 12 volumes. I want to admit right off the bat, I did not read all 12 volumes. <laughs> I read a two volume abridgment and each of those was 1,200 pages long, so I read quite a bit. But what's interesting and what's relevant for us today is what Toynbee did to try to understand the rise and the fall of civilizations. And he did it in terms of challenge and response. All civilizations are faced some way by a challenge or by many challenges. And whether or not they survive and thrive and last depends upon how well they respond and how appropriately they respond. Well, he starts way back, and he starts with a challenge that maybe you'd think of, but I sure didn't think of. And he starts with ancient Inca Peru and ancient Egypt, and the challenge they faced, he said, was environmental. They faced such a hostile environment, the question was, could they establish a sufficiently strong and vibrant agricultural economy to support a civilization? Well, we know they succeeded. You can go to, to uh, uh, Peru and see the temples at Machu Picchu. They obviously generated enough wealth not only to feed themselves and to live among themselves, but to build those magnif magnificent temples that have lasted for centuries. And the same thing is true up and down the Nile. But those two civilizations fell victim to another challenge, the challenge of a stronger military outside invader. In the case of uh, Peru, it was the Spaniards. In the case of Egypt, it was the Ottoman Turks. And so those societies fell into disrepair and eventually declined. That's a challenge we're familiar with, an outside military challenge. We faced it in Hitler. We faced it again in the long Cold War with the Soviet Union and add in an ideological challenge as well as a military challenge. But when you look at the two civilizations that we most admire in America, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, they fell victim to another kind of challenge. It's a challenge that Toynbee calls schisms in the soul of the society, schisms in the body politic, internal divisions that gradually weaken and drag down the civilization until it falls slowly into decline. And if there is a challenge that we face that is very difficult for us to find the answer to, that is it. Our challenge is the challenge from within, not the challenge from without. So that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Now, when we take a look at America today and we see the inequalities and we see the problems, we see the mess, you know, there is a question, can we reclaim the American dream? Can we get back up on our feet? Can we pull together? And one of the things I do as a reporter is to try to understand what's happened in order to figure out where we might go. Not just to go racing off into the future, but to take some time to go back into the past. And when I go back into the past and I think about America, and I think about my own experience, my own life, uh, coming out of college in the mid-50s and so forth, there was a time, it seemed to me, when our politics worked. Yes, Republicans and Democrats fought. Uh, they fought in every election for the control of the White House, for the control of Congress, and so forth. But, you know, Dwight Eisenhower would have uh, Lyndon Johnson, the majority leader of the Senate, and Sam Rayburn, the Texas uh, Speaker of the House, down and they would drink branch water at the White House at the end of the day, and they would try to figure out whether or not there was legislation they could pass. And there was a time when literally Lyndon Johnson, as the Democratic majority leader of the Senate, took a bill from Eisenhower, and because his own Republican leader, William Nolan of California, wouldn't fight for it on the floor, Johnson fought for a bill proposed by Eisenhower. Can you imagine that happening today? Can't imagine it. That's what I mean about politics working. We sent a man to the moon. We built the national highway system. We passed Medicare and Medicaid. We passed the civil rights legislation. We passed budgets every year. We don't pass budgets anymore, do you know that? You may think occasionally we pass a budget, but we don't. We pass a thing called a continuing resolution. A budget is a, is, an, is a collective effort to figure out what our national priorities are and to put together a budget the way a family does and says this is how we're gonna spend our money. A continuing resolution is an admission that we can't come together and we're just gonna to continue to do what we have been doing. It is a failure even when it's a success, okay? So there's a huge difference between then and now in that respect. Secondly, I recall, or it seemed to me as though I recalled, 
that there were considerable differences in the economy. We had poverty, we had ups and downs in the economy, but we seemed to have a sort of sh shared prosperity, a sense that everybody was sort of, you know, they say a rising tide lifts all boats. There was a sense that as the economy grew, everybody's boat was being lifted. But I said to myself, you know, Smith, you're white-haired, and white-haired people have a tendency to say, you know, when I was young, things were okay. As Lyndon Johnson would say, boy, just do it the same way we did it when I was young, and you'll be all right. And you'll just be all right. So I thought, I'd better go back and check. I did. From 1945 through the end of the 1970s, the productivity of the American workforce, that which is the engine of growth, that which drives living standards up, rose almost double, 97% over a 30, 32-year period. And the median hourly wage and benefits of the average worker in America rose 95%. 97 and 95. What that means is the growth of the economy, the efficiency of the economy, the profits of great American corporations got passed through the people at the, right at the middle of society. That's pretty successful. Also, economists like to cut us up into quintiles, top 20%, second 20%, all the way down to the bottom 20%. And if you look at the numbers for those groups, the average income within those groups all moved up kind of together, up and down, but they moved up together. In fact, the bottom two quintiles actually gained more over that period than the top quintile. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment there was income inequality or that there should be. Charlie Wilson, who ran General Motors at that point, made 35 times as much, maybe 40 times as much as the average General Motors assembly line worker. But they were within shouting distance of each other. Today, Standard & Poor 500, Standard & Poor 300 CEOs make roughly 300 times what's the average worker made. Tim Cook, two or three years ago, the CEO of Apple, made $130 $139 million in one year. He made more than 4,000 times the average Apple worker in this country. And the average Apple worker in this country, if you ever go into an Apple store, is a college graduate. They're the ones who tutor you on how to use your cell phone, how to use your laptop. These are smart kids. He's making 4,268 or something like that times that. It's totally out of whack with what they had back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So my question then is, how the hell do we do that? We're not talking socialism now. We're not talking communism. We're talking American capitalism in two different eras. Very important to keep that straight, American capitalism. Well, I found out two things are important. And by the way, in history, two things are always important, ideas and power. Ideas and power. We tend to think very much about power. We don't think so much about ideas, but ideas are critically important. The idea that was critically important at that time was something that, that a lot of people call, who study this, call stakeholder capitalism. It was the idea that the CEO of a major company had a moral responsibility, an ethical commitment to balance the economic interests of all the stakeholders in the company. Of course, that meant the owners, the stockholders. It meant the managers. It meant the employees. It meant the towns and counties in which the company had its offices or its factories. It meant the banks that loaned it money. It meant the customers who bought the products. It meant the suppliers who provided the spare parts and all the components of whatever they manufactured. And not only that, the CEOs at that time, and I've gone back and I've read what Charlie Wilson said and Reg Jones at General Electric and Irving Shapiro at, uh, at DuPont and Remington at Coca-Cola and on and on and on. I've read what they said. They thought it was smart business. They thought it was good economics. Their idea was, and economists call this the virtuous circle of growth, they thought it was smart to pay middle class workers well, because middle class workers in America basically go out and spend their money. In good times, middle class workers spend 95% of their pay, and they invest about 5% in their houses and a little bit for retirement, uh, and maybe something for the kids going to college. And in bad times, they spend 105% of their pay. So they go into debt, right? We know that. So they believed this was it. And in, in fact, it was. That was the engine that drove the enormous growth of this economy for 30, 35 years. And then what happens in the late 70s is a change of ideas and the rise of what I call wedge economics. I'll get to that in a moment. But let me go to the other point, power. This is very important for where we are today. Power, citizen power. 
If you look at the 60s and 70s in America, it is a period of citizen power. It is a period in which Trudy Sundberg epitomizes what was going on. My first exposure to it was with the Civil Rights Movement. I happened to be in Nashville, Tennessee in February 1960 when the sit-ins began. I was down in Alabama when the Freedom Rides began. I was in Birmingham, Alabama, and Martin Luther King was there and marching and got arrested. I was at the March on Washington. This was an explosion of African Americans protesting that they wanted in to American society. Now, people think of protest as simply something that's angry. But think about it. Protests are enormously idealistic. You don't protest to make something better unless you believe that it could be better. And it could be better because you are taking action to make it better. So that's a period of idealism. And around the same time, the women's movement gets started. Betty Friedan writes The Feminine Mystique 51 years ago. 1963, John F. Kennedy signs the first anti-gender discrimination about the economy. This is all moving because women are saying, we're making 41 cents on a dollar for doing the same work as men. It's not fair. And <laughs> shock of all shocks, women decide to go to Brawlis. And most of us men didn't know what to do with it. You know, we were a little puzzled here. What's going on here? And if somebody is really attractive, you say, wow. And then you say, well, what are they doing? They're saying, notice us. If we had to go brawl us, notice us because you're not treating us fairly. We're not all the way there today, but we're 80% there. We're now making eight, they were now making on the average 80, 81, 82 cents on the dollar. We've got to go further. But there are more women in Congress. There are more women CEOs. Things are changing. Things have been opening up. And guess what? We've got a woman running for president. Not unimportant, right? So things have changed because of citizen action. There was a consumer movement. Ralph Nader wrote a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. What was he saying, shock of all shocks? Detroit is making cars with mechanical defects. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Causing accidents that are maiming and killing people? And people got outraged about it. Outraged, they protested. And then women were going into stores and they were picking up the box of cereal or the box of soap that they bought last month and this box was bigger but it seemed as though it weighed less and shouldn't there be some kind of weight standards? And by the way, what's in the box? Can we have honesty in labeling? If you go into a grocery store today, or a drug store, and you turn the product over on the back and look to see what it's got in it, whether or not you want to put it in your mouth, put it on your face, feed it to your family, use it, you can thank those people in the 1970s because they put so much public pressure by demonstrating physically on Congress that Congress changed the laws and so did the Food and Drug Administration. And then take something so precious, excuse me, something so precious in this state, this gorgeous Pacific Northwest that Susan and I love right along with you, the unbelievable blue skies and those dark green evergreens, you know, and the white tops and looking today, you know, over at the Olympic Peninsula and seeing the Olympics is just stunning, or Mount Baker just glistening there in the afternoon sun. It's just unbelievable. Do you know what day we just passed? Does April 22nd mean anything to any of you? Earth Day. Did you notice anything going on around here on Earth Day? Were there demonstrations or anything like that? Is everything going on? Eh, a little bit. April 22nd, 1970, 20 million Americans went into the streets. 20 million Americans went into the streets, went to college campuses, went to <clears throat> went to shopping malls, went to congressional offices, went to state capitals, went to the mall in Washington, got on the radio, got on television, had talkathons, demanded the cleanup of the water and the air in this country. And within one year, within one year, 12 months, Congress passed seven major pieces of environmental legislation. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Anti-Toxic Substance Act, on and on and on. All but one of them signed by that great environmentalist, Richard Nixon, the Republican <laughs> president. You all know Bill Ruckelshaus. He's from uh, Seattle. He was the first head of the Environmental Protection Agency. He's a friend of mine. I've known him. I've talked to him. I've interviewed him on, on television. I did a documentary some years ago called Poison Waters about what's happened at Puget Sound and, and Chesapeake Bay. And at that time, I said to Bill, did I miss something? Was Nixon a closet greenie and I just, I just didn't get it? 
And he said, Rick, he said, in all the years I worked for him, Nixon never asked me once, Bill, is it really bad out there? Uh, is it really true that if you put your arm into the Potomac River, it comes out covered with green slime because of the algae caused by chemical pollution? No, he said, the one thing he said, I remember Nixon saying to me, he said, when you get over there to EPA, don't let the bureaucrats over there at EPA capture you. Thank you for the laughter. Nixon was the only person in Washington who thought the acronym for the EPA, an agency which he himself had created, he thought it was EPA. <laughs> so I said, I said at Ruckel's house, so why did he do it? Why did he sign all that legislation? He said he did it because the people demanded it. The people demanded it. We in government had to respond. That's the way democracy works. Holy Moses, I was back in high school when he said that. People demand it, government responds, that's how democracy works. I hadn't noticed that happening that much recently, uh, but that's what he said. And that's what was going on. And people not only demanded those things, they demanded greater fairness in the economy. They demanded that the tops be knocked off the mountains and the bottom be lifted in the basement. And so every three or four years, the minimum wage got raised. And it got way, I mean, if you look at the votes, you won't believe them. They're like 75 to 10 and 82 to 18 and stuff like that. Bipartisan all the way. It was just done, it was done not automatically, but was done pretty regularly. And at the same time, the tax rate. Do you remember what the tax rate was under Dwight Eisenhower? 92%. 92%. If you talk to people today about a 92% tax rate, they will tell you the economy will come to a dead standstill, right? The, job, the great job creators will not do anything. Well, it turns out the growth rate was better then than now. I'll get to that in a moment. It gets dropped down to 77% under Kennedy, okay? The growth rate in that two decades of the American economy, on average, was 3 to 3.1 percent, okay? Ups and downs, valleys and hills, all that kind of stuff, but 3 to 3.1 percent. Fast forward to the growth rate of, th of a tax rate of 35 percent started by Reagan, but then perpetuated by both George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Notice in each instance, I've given you both a Democrat and a Republican. This is not a partisan argument. This has to do with the philosophy of the period, the prevailing idea of the period, the power of ideas. The growth rate in the 2000s, including the period before the collapse, was 1 to 1.1%. 1 .1%. So you had high taxes and you had high growth rate, and you had lower taxes, you had a lower growth rate. I'm not saying you should lower the taxes to, get, uh, to, to raise the taxes to get a higher growth rate. I'm saying there is no connection. But what was going on was a, a, a narrowing of the inequality of income at the top and the raising at the bottom. Okay. So that was the idea that was important. And citizens' power was enforcing that idea. The exercise of activism by citizens, by people in the mold of Trudy Sandberg, was affecting the way the government operated in Washington and probably in Olympia and all across the country. Okay, so what happened? Two things happened. Ideas changed and power changed. Part of what happened with the power situation was that, well, let me take ideas first, it's simpler. The idea changed from stakeholder capitalism to what is now called shareholder capitalism. An economist who won the Nobel Prize from Chicago University named Milton Friedman wrote a book called Democracy and Capitalism in 1961 in which he said the sole mission, the sole responsibility, the sole obligation of the CEO is to maximize return to shareholders. Ever heard that? Yeah, you sure do. You hear it a lot. And it takes about 20 years before that idea starts to be taught at Harvard Business School and Stanford, probably at UW, uh, I don't know that for sure, but certainly the Wharton School at, at the University of Pennsylvania and all across the country. And we get a generation of business leaders who were taught that their job is to do that. Now, if you have to give something to the workers or if you have to give something to the banks or one thing, in order to get there, you make some concessions. But that, you're no longer balancing economic interests, okay? What happens? What happens is what I call the rise of wedge economics. There's a wedge driven between the growth of the economy and productivity and the living standard of the middle class in America. From the late 1970s until about, 19, until about 2012, 2013, the productivity of the American workforce rises about 80%. Not as good as before, but still pretty damn good. The median hourly pay and benefits rises 10% and mainly because more women went to work. 
an economist uh, at, at Princeton and an economist at UC California, uh, uh, Emmanuel Saiz at Berkeley, and uh, I'm gonna think of the Princeton guy's name in a minute, study what happened to income over that period of time. Alan Kruger is the Princeton economist. And what they found was that in the period from 1979 to 2013, 84% of the entire growth of the nation's economy went to the top 1%. 84%. Now, when I first heard the slogan of, of Occupy Wall Street, the 99% and the 1%, I thought, that is a very clever political slogan. It's an exaggeration. It's a bumper sticker slogan. It looks really great in the numbers, but it can't be that bad. And then I came across this thing from Alan Krieger and Emmanuel Saiz. And if you do the arithmetic, if the top 1% gets 84%, that only leaves 16% for the other 99%, so they're getting five times as much as the 99% at the top. That's the 99% and the 1%. It turns out that it's not a bumper sticker slogan. It is an accurate representation of what has happened to the American economy over the last three decades. That is profound. That is profound. If 84% of a nation's growth in income is going to 1% of its population, how in God's name can anyone contend that that economy is serving most people well? It's an impossible proposition. I mean, I remember studying Jeremy Bentham back at Oxford as a, as a British philosopher. He said the job of democracy is the greatest good for the greatest number, if you want a quick slogan. Something close to that has got to be uh, what we're driving for. So shareholder capitalism dramatically changed the distribution of wealth, and the decisions were being made the decisions were being made by the leadership of American corporations. Most people will tell you, and the first explanation got, I got, and frankly, what I believe before I did the research on this book, Who Stole the American Dream, is you know, the inequality of income in America is really the result of globalization, modern technology, uh, the cheap labor in, in, in China. You know, there's nothing we can, or now it's Vietnam or Bangladesh, and whatnot. there's nothing we can do about it. Well, there's a certain amount of truth to that, but it's a half truth because there is this component in which the leadership of American businesses have been making decisions again and again and again to reward themselves and to hold the living standard and the wages of ordinary workers pretty level. A little bit of growth, but mostly stagnant over a period. Less than 1% growth per year over a 40-year period. And the cost of health care, the cost of higher education, and the cost of housing are skyrocketing. There's no way a middle class family who's making average incomes can possibly afford to pay its bills over that, for, that period. It's not that they can't manage their money well. A lot of them can't, and they are to blame. But if you take the average figures, it's not possible for average families to do it, unless they start working two and three and four jobs. So the change in that idea had a profound impact on economic inequality and ultimately on power inequality. And the second thing that happened was a political revolution only the thing that's really interesting about this political revolution is that unlike most revolutions, it occurred from the top down and not from the bottom up. There was a revolution led by the corporate elite that begins in the 1970s, around the same time as you get wedge economics appearing. It is triggered by a guy named Lewis Powell, who is a famous corporate attorney, who was complaining to his friends at the US Chamber of Commerce back in 1971 that business was, a free enterprise in America was in danger, and it was in danger not mainly from Soviet communism, but from strong trade unions, from the women's movement, from the environmental movement, from the black movement, and from the consumer movement. And his buddies at the Chamber of Commerce says, well, that's really smart, you're a lawyer, write a brief. And Lewis Powell wrote what I consider the most important neglected document in American history over the last 50 years, the Lewis Powell Memorandum, of August 1971, and I thought it was so important that I persuaded my publisher to print the text of it in the back of my book so you can see it. And what happened was amazing. Powell's memo was circulated privately. I want to tell you, I was running the Washington Bureau of the New York Times in the late 70s while this stuff was going on. We had no idea what was happening. We had no idea. We saw the symptoms. We saw the results. We had no idea what the cause was. We saw all kinds of political things happening that I'll get to in a moment. But what was going on was Powell's memo was being circulated to the bosses of these big corporations. Well, within four months, the business roundtable had been formed. 
Now, those of you who know American politics know that the Business Roundtable is the single most powerful voice of blue chip corporate America in Washington today. And you probably thought it had existed forever, but it didn't. It was formed in late 1971, about four months after Powell's memo was circulated. And then the next thing that happened was the National Association of Manufacturers, because Powell said, you got to go fight. You got to go fight the labor unions and the consumer movement and the women's movement, all this. And that means you got to go to Washington. You got to move your offices to Washington. You got to hire lobbyists. You got to put money into political campaigns, political action committees, PACs. Now we call them super PACs. That all got started in this period right here. Okay? <laughs> it's astonishing. The National Association of Manufacturers moved its headquarters from Chicago to Washington. The US Chamber of Commerce doubled its staff and tripled its, uh, its budget. Um, by 1980, before Reagan is elected, there are 9,000 registered corporate lobbyists in Washington. When Powell wrote his memo, memo, there were 175 companies that had offices in Washington. By the time Reagan was elected, there were 2,425. 175 to 2,425. There were 50,000 people by 1980 working for business trade associations. There was an army. I call it Powell's army. And what's really interesting, and what blew my mind as a guy who had followed the politics here closely, the watershed in American policy, the shift in American policy, the result of this change in power, the receding of the citizens' movements, which in some ways had been so successful, they figured, oh, we can just leave it to somebody else to take care of it now. There's an EPA. We don't need to worry about the environment. You know, as if women are getting paid better, uh, whatever. Yeah. 1978 was the pivotal year. It's the year when we start to get deregulation of trucking and airlines and communication. It is the year in which the, the capital gains tax rate, you probably never thought of giving Jimmy Carter credit for this, but the capital gains tax rate gets dropped from 48% to 28%, single biggest drop in the core capital gains rate, which, which benefits everybody who is a stockholder, of course. But you need to know that the people who studied American income tax returns over the last decade say the top 1% get 50% of all the tax benefits from capital gains. Top 1%, again, benefiting enormously. And guess what else? 1978 is the year when they passed the corporate bankruptcy law reform, which has devastating effects on union benefits in the steel industry and the airline industry and a number of other industries come the late 1990s. It takes quite a while for this to play through, but it happens then. And the final thing is 1978 is the year that the 401k gets written into law. Now, the 401k, you need to understand, was never intended as a national retirement system. The 401k was put into law by an upstate New York Republican congressman, a very good congressman named Barbara Conable, whom I knew quite well. And he did it as a favor for Xerox uh, and uh, Kodak, which have their headquarters in his district. It was a tax shelter for deferred profit sharing gains for executives of those companies and about a half a dozen New York banks. Would you ever imagine that anybody who wanted to pass a national retirement program, that they would call it 401k? No, it's called 401k because it's in paragraph 401 of the tax code in subparagraph k. It was designed not to be noticed, OK? But then it got reinterpreted by the Reagan Treasury Department, one thing or another. And the next thing you know, the mutual fund industry says, oh my god, we could get to manage a whole lot of money that the banks were managing previously for companies. It's an enormous profit boom, and it takes off in the 80s. And guess what? What happens is that 40% of the cost of retirement gets shifted from companies to individuals. Individuals paid 11% of the retirement prior to the 401k, and companies paid 89%. After 401k was passed, individuals pay 51% of the cost of retirement, and companies paid 49%. And today, the figure is even more lopsided. So it's a huge shift, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. So the change in economic policy, which begins to exaggerate and accelerate this income inequality I was talking about before in the private sector, is now accelerated even faster because of the change in public policy. Public policy matters. Then we get the Reagan tax cuts. 1981, which adds a trillion dollars to the wealth of the top 1% every decade. A trillion in the 80s, a trillion in the 90s, and a trillion in the 2000s. And then the George W. Bush tax cuts add another trillion, $4 trillion. So we have all that on top of 
this change in the way the private sector pie is being cut up. So that's how we got to where we are. Then this money starts pouring into the political system, okay? So we go back to 2006, you know what dark money is. Money we can't trace, money that comes from anonymous donors, money that is basically put into 501c4s, which were originally set up to be Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, hospitals, genuine social welfare organizations, but people who are running political campaigns said, you know, why don't we set up something that sounds like Americans for Prosperity or, or Americans for Goodness or whatever, you know, and, and we'll contribute money to political campaigns because those organizations do not have to disclose their donors. In 2006, there was about $5 million of dark money in American politics. In 2012, there was 300 million, 302 million. This year, it's going way over a half a billion. The super PACs, super PACs, I can tell you right now, are running about $700, billion, $700 million, excuse me, of, of campaign contributions. At this stage in 2012, they were half that. So in this campaign, even though you're looking at an election in which it looks as though money doesn't matter, because Trump is self-financed and Bernie is raising money from small donors, the amount of super PAC money is going right through the roof. And guess where it's going? It's coming into your state. It's going into Ohio. It's going into Indiana. It's going into Illinois. It's going into the control of the US Senate. It's going into the control of the Congress, OK? So we've got that money going in there. And then you have something else going on that's really interesting and important. Less of a problem in Washington state than in other states, but still a bit of a problem here, and that's gerrymandering. We all learned about gerrymandering in high school and in college. Gerrymandering today is a massive industry that is operated by really sophisticated computer software so that the strategists of each side, both Democrats and Republicans, do it. This is a totally nonpartisan monopoly. This is a duopoly. Remember, a classic duopoly. Democrats, Republicans, make sure nobody, everybody says, can we have a third party? Not a chance as long as we have this kind of gerrymandering going on. It's dead. Uh, there's no way you can do it. Um, today, listen to this. 85 to 90 percent of all the congressional districts in the country are so gerrymandered that right now, if I took the time, I could tell you which party was going to win the general election six months in advance of the general election. And a really good political reporter for Charlie Cook's reporter, whatever, he could have told you a year ago because of gerrymandering. Now think about the distortion of democracy here. I have to go back to my basic civics. If you remember when the Founding Fathers set up the elections, they said you really can't trust the people to elect a president. You can't have a popular vote. You've got to set up this awkward thing called an electoral college to kind of filter it and just sort of be, we don't trust democracy quite that much, so let's put something in between. And the second thing they said was, and senators, they're going to be in office for six months. We can't have direct election of senators. Remember that? We didn't get direct election of senators until 1916 one of those amendments that got passed under Woodrow Wilson along with the women's vote, right? But the one thing we will do is we'll set up a house of representatives where there are elections every two years and we'll let the people vote directly. We'll call it the people's house. Do you remember, ever remember that phrase in your college political science or government or civics classes? The people's house. So at the moment, we have a people's house in which we're supposed to have competition so the people can render a verdict on the government's actions and policies of the last two years. And we now have 90% of it set up as monopolies to prevent the people from being able to make that choice. If you remember not recently, several times we had the government shut down. You look at the national opinion polls, and the people are against shutting down the government. But if you go to the districts of the 40 representatives who are really running that, in their district, only about 7 or 8% voted in the party primaries, and they really would like to see the government shut down. So what the public wants as a whole is being distorted by a system that's protecting the same group of people who overthrew John Boehner, and who now pose a threat to Paul Ryan, and who will pose a threat to the next president, whichever party he or she comes from. So we have some fundamental problems here, ladies and gentlemen. These are problems that, God, I wish Trudy were here. She'd be up here. My God, she'd be going in 90 different directions. She'd have us all moving. That's what we need now. Part of our problem in America today is we've lost faith in people power. 
I have a friend in Texas named Ernie Cortez. He's one of the great organizers in the Southwest. He, he, he organizes, as you might guess from his name, he organizes Hispanic voters in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California. He said, Rick, he said there's that famous saying by Lord Acton, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But he said, you know what? Powerlessness also corrupts. Powerlessness corrupts democracy at the core. If we, if people like you and me, people in this room, if we believe we don't have the power to change our country today, it's over. We've got to go back to believing in ourselves. We've got to go back to being, how many of there are you? 300 here, 250? 250 Trudy Sundbergs. I'm serious. And I'm saying this to audiences all over this country. Every time we talk about politics, if we say they've got to fix it, it just flew out the window. They are not going to fix it. They actually like it the way it is. They're in office, and they're getting the policies they want, which is the status quo, which is highly unequal. Highly unequal in terms of income, highly unequal in terms of power. That's why Trump's near nomination is so upsetting to the Republican elite. It's upsetting for lots of other reasons, too. Let me be honest about it. Yeah. But, but there is a tendency to say all the negative things about him without recognizing that he is actually speaking for a whole lot of dispossessed millions who feel as though their voice has been shoved aside by their own party, and they are fed up with it. And there's no question about Bernie and what he's saying. He's saying we got a rigged system economically, we got a rigged system politically, we got Wall Street having too much money. Okay, so I'm back to it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is up to us. It is up to us in this room. It is up to us in this room tonight to decide we have to do something about it. Now, people will then say to me, actually, I spoke this morning at Oak Harbor High School, and a bunch of kids came up to me afterwards. I was so happy, and they said, what can we do? Do you know about I-1464? Do anybody in this room know about I-1464? I-1464 is a proposal that is now being circulated in Washington State. It needs 300 signatures to be put on the ballot this November. And I didn't come here to advocate for this. I came here to tell you this is an example of something you could decide to do, OK? It calls for average voters to get two or three $50 vouchers so they can give the money to the candidate of a choice and reduce the power of mega donors. It says that contractors and lobbyists cannot give more than $100 to any politician who, once they're in office, the lobbyist or the corporation is going to do business with them. Okay? Uh, it says that any campaign donation over a certain amount, I think it's $5,000, from any group that spends $5,000 on electionary communications must disclose the original donors. It's not satisfactory for Super PAC A to say, we got our money from Super PAC B, when really they got it from Jim Jones and, 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 and Sylvia Johnson and so on and so forth. We want to know the Jim Jones and the Sylvia Johnson, okay? So it's got several provisions like that. Then there's I-735. Do you know this I-735? Do you know what I-735 is? Yes, this lady does. I-735 is a proposal already on the ballot, already got more than 330,000 signatures that says Washington state voters this fall either will or will not Go on record as saying we need an amendment to the U.S. Constitution to roll back Citizens United and restore the power of... <laughs> but my point, ladies, this is going on all over the country. This actually is a very exciting uh, time of opportunity. This is, you know, I follow this. I have a website called reclaimtheamericandream.org. What we do is we try to track reform going on all over this country. <laughs> The best gerrymander reform in this country over the last 10 years has happened in Florida. And the second best has happened in Arizona. Now, did you figure Florida and Arizona were going to be out front? <laughs> Do you know what's going on in South Dakota this year? South Dakota? <laughs> South Dakota has three reforms. They've got a nonpartisan primary, like the Washington State top two. That's on there. They've got gerrymander reform with an independent redistricting committee. And they have the same kind of bill as, as I 1464 here in Washington. This is, you know, it may or may not pass. The gerrymander reform in Florida took five tries before it passed. But the point is, people in America are starting to say, we're fed up and we've got to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is up to us. Please, please don't let this just be a talk. 
please honor, please honor Trudy by actually getting engaged. Marshall Goldberg is out there. He is dying to get you moving. Please do it. Thank you very much. This is too smart an audience for everybody to have agreed with what I said, so, uh, so, so have at it. Let's, let's discuss, because that's another one of the things we need to rediscover in America is a way to meet together in the village square where we can disagree without being disagreeable. We've kind of lost that ability. Yes, sir, please go ahead. I don't know if it's on. It is on. Um, I, I agree with you completely. I'm not here to disagree with you at all. I, I notice that I'm being manipulated. And I'm being manipulated by the news media, for example. I guess they're probably owned by Disney or GE or whoever they're owned by. But I noticed on CBS News, the top story was about some guy that killed two other people with a gun in Washington, D.C. today and tracking down the, uh, the perpetrator of that. And that, those, those um, events over and over again are taking the top spot in our national news media over and over again when how can a, an electorate understand about economics or geopolitics or anything like that if all we're hearing about is mass shootings this is not this is not stuff that we need to know about you're right i don't think okay and and, and then there's another thing that occurred that didn't get reported on and that is there's a guy who flew his airplane onto the lawn of Congress, which is illegal, by the way. And in it, he had a letter from each one of the 50 states talking about in favor of campaign finance reform. And the media reported on him violating the congressional airspace, but not on what he was carrying. Oh, no, that's not true. I mean, I think your general charge about the media is fair. Okay, let me take the last thing for it. I, I don't think that's true. It, it, that story was pretty well reported on both sides. But are you right in saying that the media is not giving a good job, not doing a good job covering the most important stories? Yes, no question about it. I wrote a book called Recl uh, Who Stole the American Dream? And along with other journalists, for 30 years, I missed the most important story in America, which is the growth of inequality, of income and power. We didn't cover that story. We covered this factory closing, or that factory closing, or this strike that failed, or these jobs that went overseas, but we never put it together. And part of what's happened in the media today uh, is that two, things, two or three things have happened. Number one, one of the things you said is absolutely right on. The main television networks are now owned by corporations which insist that the news department be a profit center. When Bill Paley owned and ran CBS News, Edward R. Murrow and Eric Severide and all those guys, Charles Collingwood and the rest of them, were out doing deep investigative reporting you know, about migrant farm workers and about you name it, because Paley was willing to accept a loss. This was their service to American democracy. We can demand that back. We can demand that the FCC, we as a people, you're right, it's happened and it's wrong, but we can start demanding that the FCC, when it renews the broadcast licenses, both for networks and for stations, that they have to commit themselves to certain uh, basic standards of coverage. We got rid of the Fairness Doctrine in, 1780, in 1987. And under the Fairness Doctrine, if you had a talk radio show host, and I won't name anybody in particular, but your minds will quickly gravitate towards some, and they were taking a particular side, the obligation was that you had to have the other side have an equal amount of time. Right. Getting rid of the Fairness Doctrine was a big change that contributes to the trends that I was just talking about tonight. So that's true. The second thing that's happened is uh, the industry is just going through perilous cuts in income, and that means cuts in staff. To do the kind of reporting I'm talking about tonight, um, to do the kind of reporting that's going to put together the picture that you ought to have and that we ought to be delivering, takes time, takes money, takes skilled people. And what's going? What have you? What's happened in Seattle? We've got one paper now instead of two. 
All right, the PI staff has gone on the air to try to put together a regional report and try to fill in some of the blanks. People are working on this. We may have to decide that news is a public utility in order to get the kind of reporting that you're talking about or to get the kind of timely analysis that you're talking about to voters and, and to people all across the country all the time. There may have to be some coming together of universities, of public television stations, of libraries, of that whole nonprofit sector. If you go to Europe, the not, they think, of, they think of, of power and they think of the way the society operates is sitting on a three-legged stool, the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. And all of those play an important role. We haven't thought that out. I mean, there are a whole bunch of things we need to think about. I'm completely with you in terms of your critique of the media. Absolutely. What leads bleeds. Why? Because they want eyeballs. Why do they want eyeballs? They want advertising. Why do they want advertising? They want ratings. Why do they want ratings? They want income. Why do they want income? The boss has said you've got to have income. So we got to change that dynamic. And part of it is, let's all admit some responsibility here. A lot of people want to watch that titillating stuff. I mean, all that stuff about Trump and the outrageous things that he said, the media is partly responsible for having created Trump. OK? But you, but you better believe the audience really loved it. When he's talking, to, to, he's confronting a television anchor and suggesting her tough questions are related to her menstrual cycle. I mean, that's outrageous. It's outrageous. But people were so titillated by that. My God, they played it and overplayed it. What do you mean? Did he really mean it? What did she say? What did they think? They went, and is Fox going to fire her? They got a promoter. I mean, it's wacko. And part of it is the public's own hunger for bread and circuses to go back to ancient Rome. So I'm, I'm with you. I think we need to sit down. I think we need to have talks between citizens and the people who are running the media. It's well worth taking the time to take a delegation from Whidbey to down to King and you know, the others down there, Cairo and so forth down in Seattle, and, and say something about what you just said to me. I mean, I think this is something we need to fight for. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. sorry. She's Great. got the I'll mic. Pass I didn't, this right I didn't, down I didn't see. You. Sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you if you would say a few words about Milton Friedman, because he just, he seems to be like deep throat, you know, he's way Oh, no, back no, he, deep throat was secret. Milton yeah. Friedman was right out in front. Yeah. But I'd love to have your perspective on well, it. Well, Mil Milton Friedman, I mean, Milton Friedman said a number of things. Milton Friedman is a famous economist, and he won the Nobel Prize for his analysis of the way markets work. And most economists, including economists well to the left of him, like Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz, will respect the economic or the econometric work that Friedman did. But Friedman went way beyond that. He became an economic philosopher in which he was saying what people ought to do, not what the market was doing. There's a difference. We in the media have that problem now. We're no longer content to report with what happened and analyzing it. We want to tell you what's going to happen next. Beware of reporters along with everybody else who's telling you about the future, OK? So what Friedman did was he, he, he sanctified this doctrine of the role and the function of the corporation and the CEO. And then one of his disciples, a guy named Mike Jensen, who became an associate professor at Harvard Business School, took Friedman's idea one step further and said, you know, if you really want CEOs to deliver maximum return to shareholders, you need to make them shareholders. So instead of paying them in money, pay them in shares. And we're not talking about paying them in 50 shares, 5,000 shares. Sometimes they get paid a million shares. The champion of all was Larry Ellison of, of uh, Oracle. Uh, in the uh, late 1990s, he got paid $700 million in Oracle stock one year. Amazing amount of money, okay? And actually, Jensen saw what happened was CEOs got very good at playing this game, and they could, they could jack up the price of the stock, cash in, get out, the stock might go down. They are not like ordinary stockholders. In the first place, they got all kinds of inside information. In the second place, if the stock doesn't go up, they go back to the board and they say, you know, I really got screwed. And you really need to give me new shares because the stock has gone down. Now, the deal was the shares was at 40. And they were supposed to get a bonus if it went to 45. But instead, it went down to 35. So now they want new shares at 35, and they want to throw away the old shares. And then what started to happen in America was companies started to backdate shares. They started to fill around with shares. There was a study done by Harvard economists and a bunch of other people. And they found out that 800 major companies, the boards of directors, had altered now, it's not clear to me why this is not a crime. This is fraud, right? They altered the dates 
of when the shares were issued so that inevitably the CEOs got paid more money. It was crooked, okay? Apple, Steve Jobs, Apple did it over 4,000 times. They altered the dates of their shares. Total dishonesty. Uh, that's also in my book. But what's astonishing to me is the total corruption of what was intended to be an intelligent incentive system. And um, can you blame Friedman for all that? Yes and no. I mean, he came up with a basic idea, but other people you know, then played it to the hilt. But he played a very important role. And because of his august stature as a thinker, he began to be taught in the business schools. And then he began to be translated. And then Jensen came along and added the other. And he had a tremendous impact in this idea shift that I was talking about. And that's very, very important. And we need an idea shift, not back, but forward to another better idea in which we share the wealth better. Maybe somebody over yeah, here. Yeah, I, I have the, in, the mic. Oh, I'd you like got the mic, say, then you're it. I have it. the mic. We have the internet. And we can communicate with a click. And we are not doing that. We're not using Facebook. We're not using, we're not creating flash mobs. We need you, you are our August thinker, and we need you to give us three demands so we can stay on message, and we need to storm the media, we need to storm the legislatures, and we need to become part of public pressure, and they cannot ignore us, because this has gone on way too long. So in your book, which I intend to buy, are there three My children, things? thank you. <laughs> Are there three, uh, three demands? Oh, God. <laughs> Just three. Well, I wish my wife should get up at this point. It's a, it's, a, it's a very funny moment. I write this book, okay? And I'm writing this book with the analysis that you heard tonight, okay? I get to the end of it, and I send it in to my editor at Random House. Her name is Kate Medina. And she says, Rick, this is a hell of a job, but you've left us in the ditch. You have absolutely got to tell us how to get out of the ditch, like you. She, she, she didn't say three, but she said, get us out of the ditch. And I said, Kate, I'm a reporter. And my job as a reporter is to call balls and strikes, foul and fair, tell the story the way it is, let the chips while they may. There are think tanks in Washington. There are parties. There are White House, Council of Economic Advisors. Everybody, it's their job. She comes back to me, and she says, Rick, that's no good. You've actually got to tell us what to do. And I'm about to say no when this lady over here, would you stand up again? Would you stand up? Susan says to me, Rick, Kate's right. You got to do it. I did it. The last two, last two chapters of my book are Hedrick Smith's handy dandy 10 step plan to save America. <laughs> Now, I'm, re I'm really glad you laughed because I felt awkward doing it. But I I'm not a genius. I'm a reporter. And so I went and I got what I thought were intelligent ideas that other people had. And I started to put them down. And eight of them are in economics and two of them are in politics. And the most important one in, in politics is what you said a moment ago. Folks, we can't let anybody else do it. We have to decide to do it ourselves. So to that end, after I published the book, I launched a website which is called, and I hope you all will go there, not just because it will boost my ego, and it'll do that, and that'll be nice too, but, but the real reason is it's out there to serve people. Reclaimtheamericandream.org. Reclaimtheamericandream.org. And what we have taken a look at is amending the Constitution, public funding of campaigns, exposing dark money, gerrymander reform, Minimum wage, student debt, more inclusive capitalism. On each issue, there is an issue brief. And there is a progress report that you will not believe, because it tells you what is going on in almost every state of the union, if anything is going on. You will not believe how much is going on. The media is not beginning to report it. Back to your question. That's why I'm doing it. Okay, And then there's a success story. And do you want to know what one of the success stories is on minimum wage? It is the story of SeaTac's fight for the $15 minimum wage. And you're going you're gonna to read some, th I went out to SeaTac, and I actually talked to some of the Muslim preachers out there, people from Ethiopia, people from Somalia,
people that I'm not sure that even the Seattle newspapers got around to talk to. And those are the kinds of stories you're going to find there. It's there. It's there for you. Get young people to go there. Uh, I don't have any stake in it. I'm not making a penny of money out of it personally. I, I believe, I think you can tell at this point, I believe pretty passionately in what I'm saying. And I'm doing everything I can. The 10 steps are in the book. The Reclaim the American Dream Dot Hour is out there. I-1464, which I told you about, I-7035, they're in your state. And if you've got friends in Oregon, go say, my God, Oregon is a progressive state. Where the hell are you? We've got a top two primary. Why don't you? We've tried to fix gerrymander reform. Washington state has a partial gerrymander reform fix. It could do better, but it's better than a lot of states. Where the hell's Oregon? And then how about Idaho? Come on, we can do stuff. The Pacific Northwest. Do you realize what you have in this region? You have initiative, referendum, and recall. Citizens can take action. To try to get action in, in old states like Pennsylvania and Illinois that were formed before the Western states became part of the Union, they don't have that populist method for changing their state constitutions. It's much harder. You guys have got to lead the way. We guys have got to lead the way. OK, how about over here? Mr. Smith, I'm up here in the back. Yeah, great. My name is Nicholas Petrish. I read your book, The Russians back in the late 80s when I was an interrogator in the US Army studying Russian at DLI. I hope it helped. Don't ask me to quote, it was a long time ago. Um, I'm also a Senate candidate in the 10th LD for Washington State. And that's like the first layer of what I'm trying to do to bring change. But I'm glad this young lady brought up the internet. I also teach a seminar called Crypto Party. Crypto and what? Crypto Party. You can look it up, you Google, Google it. It's called Crypto Party. It's done all over, all over the world. It's how to protect yourself or ourselves from mass surveillance, whether it's government, hackers, foreign governments, or foreign agents. And I'm bringing that up because of what you did for Daniel Ellsberg with the Pentagon Papers. And I would like to know what your opinion is of Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, who I consider heroes, not just for the United States, but for the whole world. And um, I don't, I, with all due respect, the paper you worked for is no longer the paper that it is today. It's the gray in lady. Some places, in some areas, it's better. Well, my, my feeling is that when it comes to national security and informing us about what's going on with our own government, they're falling way short. OK, the and only reason you know the NSA is eavesdropping is the New York Times broke the story. You sure about that? Because Absolutely. I, heard, I heard about it from a guy, nope. a guy named Jacob Applebaum, who was a computer science nope. activist out of here no, no, at no, no, no. Washington. Oh, in terms of mass communication, the New York Times broke that story. But you were asking another question, and I'll start to answer it if you hand the mic so back to somebody else, because I have a feeling as a candidate, you might like to hang on to the mic. <laughs> now, in terms of Edward Snowden, what I'd like to share with you, I didn't realize I was going to bring it up tonight. Six years before Snowden, six years before Snowden, I did a documentary for Frontline called Spying on the Home Front, which for the first time exposed that the NSA was wiretapping into email, email traffic in the San Francisco, California region. The problem we had was we did not, unlike Snowden, we didn't have any government documents. We had a whole bunch of circumstantial evidence in which we put it together, we laid it out there. So I think you can tell that I would say that if a guy named Edward Snowden exposed what the NSA was doing to our privacy, and the Congress subsequently decided that it had to amend our laws to constrain the NSA more, you've already got your answer. I mean, I mean if, if how, how can you say that that information was useful to the Congress to decide to protect us? No, no you've had a shot. Let me get other people, okay? Um, we, can sp we can spend the rest of the evening, the two of us, and not give anybody else a chance. And, and that's, not, that's not right. Um, but, but Snowden, I think, is a hero in the sense that he took the personal risk. And I think part of what happened there was that Snowden lost some credibility because he didn't stand with the risk that he took. When we did the Pentagon Papers, I will tell you, when we did the Pentagon Papers, we had no idea what the government was going to do with us. All of us were committed to doing it, and we're ready to go to jail. The last 10 days before we printed the Pentagon Papers, the New York Times moved Neil Sheehan and me. We had been working in a hotel in downtown New York for three months with all this top secret information. 
They moved us into the New York Times, and we physically lived in the New York Times for the last 10 days because they figured it would be harder for the FBI to come arrest us if we were physically in the building. The publisher of the New York Times was told by the New York Times general, uh, was told by the New York Times outside attorney that this was a violation of the Constitution, that we, we, we charged with treason, uh, and the paper would be shut down, and he was taking a risk with the property. The New York Times fired that law firm and got Floyd Abrams, who defended the New York Times under the First Amendment. Okay? So we didn't know the outcome of that, but we were prepared to, to do that because, because of two things. Number one, we were committed to telling the public what had gone on, and it was just terrible what had gone on. We had a succession of administrations from both parties over a period of 20 years that had lied repeatedly to the American people about the nature of the war and the nation's commitment to the war and what the, pub, what the government had said to other governments and what it was doing, okay? And the second thing was, we were extremely careful, unlike WikiLeaks, we were extremely careful that we did not expose anything that was live. There was a diplomatic portion of the Pentagon Papers which dealt with ongoing diplomacy which was trying to reach a secret peace deal through Burma, through various other countries, certainly through France and others. We had no idea which of these leads were alive and which weren't. And we made a collective decision at the New York Times that we were not going to expose something that could actually jeopardize national security. Our judgment was on what the Eisenhower administration did, what the Johnson administration did, what the Kennedy administration did was all history. And there was no way that could actually jeopardize national security, even though it was huge embarrassment to the politicians. So I think dealing with this kind of stuff, and I ran the Washington Bureau for a while, and I made a number of decisions myself about, about what we should print and what we shouldn't print. You want, you want somebody making those judgments with the same kind of sensitivity, a commitment to integrity, as the doctor you would talk to if you've got a serious case of cancer. You want people of really good judgment. Uh, you're not looking for sensation. You are looking to press the limits of freedom of the press to the absolute limit. But you are acknowledging, I was in Vietnam, we never printed anything we knew about unfolding battles where it could jeopardize the lives of American soldiers. There were certain, there were certain restraints that we imposed on ourselves because of our own sense of national security. But then we didn't let anybody talk us out of it. The federal government went to the executive editor of the New York Times when they were about to print the stories about the NSA eavesdropping, and they repeatedly tried to get the New York Times not to print them. The New York Times did delay for several months while they argued this out. And in the end, the New York Times said, we don't believe that's going to jeopardize national security, and we went ahead. Uh, this, is, this is a totally separate subject. It's a fascinating one. It's an important one. And our privacy is under assault. I'm with you on that. Good luck to you. Yes. Hey. Anybody else? So earlier on in the talk, you were mentioning um, uh, different protests, ways that people had come out and like made themselves visible, and some of that included uh, nonviolent civil disobedience, uh, the freedom. Certainly. Riders. Yeah. Certainly. And. I guess that resonates with me because I'm part of a group that will be going up to Anacortes on May 14th and 15th to face down the Marches Point Refinery in a mass, as part of a mass worldwide act of civil disobedience to try to break off of fossil fuels. And a question we kind of had was, what is the role in, of civil disobedience in kind of reaching, touching hearts and minds? Um, making things visible, creating change. What maybe are some examples of civil disobedience well, that you've my, seen that you thought my, of? Yeah, my, my most immediate example of them, you know, are the police dogs in Birmingham and the fire hoses and the bull whips, uh, the billy clubs that were being used on young people who were down in Birmingham marching in the streets um, asking for uh, lunch counters at which both blacks and whites could sit. Drinking fountains, which could be used by both blacks and whites, job opportunities for blacks in the grocery stores and the and the supermarkets and the and the department stores there, uh, and those images captured on national television turned public opinion around gradually. It's very interesting. Um, Martin Luther King wrote a famous letter, the letter from the Birmingham jail. Maybe you've heard the phrase uh, when he was arrested. And people, a lot of people who've heard about that letter and haven't read it, um, 
think that it was a letter that attacked segregation. It did that, of course, but that's not who it was written for. It was written for the people in the middle, in Alabama, in Birmingham, who really were privately critical of Jim Crow, of discrimination, but were sitting on the fence not acting. And what he said, what you were doing, is you were reinforcing Jim Crow, and you have to get off the fence. That is what civil disobedience does. What it does is it forces people to say, is this an issue on which we think there is something, there's a higher law, there's a higher moral, there's a higher ethic, or even within the laws there's a higher law than the one that is being acted on or ignored. So you're raising a fundamental question for citizenry in a democracy to make judgments that democracy demos, the Greek word means people, that the people have to decide. We have to get back to that. And the great thing about this campaign is it's the first one I've seen in a long time where is this sense of an authentic connection between millions of people and a candidate who is saying to you, saying to us, we have the right to do this, we should do this, what's being done is wrong, and we need to act on that. So without making any judgment about your particular cause, although I could and it wouldn't be hard, uh, I think the, that act done thoughtfully, done strategically, not just tactically, but done thoughtfully, and to make sure that you're really raising a fundamental question, then it has an appropriate place. But you have to be prepared to pay the price. I mean, the thing that King was prepared to do was to be arrested. I started to say about Snowden to the earlier questioner, who I gather has left now that he's made his talk, um, uh, uh, was that, was that, was that um, Snowden would have had much more power in this country if he'd stayed here and been arrested. But by leaving, he undercut some of his own credibility. He, he deserves credit for what he did, I think, but he undercut it. So I think it's very important if you're going to engage in civil disobedience to say, I'm being deliberately disobedient. I believe the law is wrong. The law needs to change. I need to bring that to your attention this way. That's, that's what I learned from the people I followed. Yes, ma'am. If you can belt it out without the Mac. Do you, do you, where do you live? Here in Whidbey Island. Uh, what, what town? Langley. Okay, I want to tell you, I was at Oak Harbor High School today. I would not have said I was terribly impressed with the level of knowledge of American government at Oak Harbor High School as a result of my interchange with those students. So, um, and then when I talked afterwards to one of the teachers, they said, we don't teach civics anymore. Yeah. I certainly think people could use a lot more information, but I would have said that um, I would have said that both the responses to public opinion polls and the action of voters in this year's election show that at least 20 million people are thinking about what's going on, and there are going to be more in the, in the time ahead. I mean, there's always a, a, there's always a lack, and could we do better in our schools? Absolutely. I, I would love to see an America in which after the kids say the Pledge of Allegiance, at every grade, they spend the next five minutes talking about something about American politics. Either learn the name of the president or the vice president or the senator or whatever. And then as you get older, learn more. You can't teach, part of the problem is we've sort of cornered that and said we're going to teach that in civics, you know, get it out of the way and you've got to do that over here to the social studies teacher who's then got to become a genius at sort of energizing and, and, and intriguing uh, and enchanting the younger generation. Uh, 
That's not how other nations do it. You do it, you learn it on the way. So how about the Pledge of Allegiance, five minutes, uh, pledge plus five, you know, or something, something like that, okay? Yeah, over here, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't see you, it's a little hard. That's okay, uh, hi, my name's Anna. I, I wanna comment on what that beautiful lady said right there. I think, if you don't mind, <laughs> I think one of the things, I have a 15, almost 15 year old son and a 12 year old daughter, and my son comes home, he's a freshman in high school at Kamiak, and he says, mom, no one will let us talk about anything else besides what they believe. And I think in their homes, in, in, our, in our school system, it's so divisive. And you see on the internet, we can't have a conversation about anything just slightly different with a different perspective. So if you live in Washington versus you live in Utah, you're getting a whole different perspective because you're not allowed to speak up, especially as a 15-year-old boy. And he's, mom, I don't understand. I said, I, I, can't, I can't fix it all, right? I can't fix it all. So I think part of the problem is we're so divisive and we won't connect. But that's, I just wanted to say that. But my comment, my I want, can, can I take a shot at that and then you can get a second shot? Okay. I run into this problem. I'm not running for any office. Okay. <laughs> I run into not this, yet. I run into this problem almost everywhere. And I finally ran into some people who had an answer for what you just said. I was in Tallahassee, Florida. I was invited there by a group called To the Village Square. To the Village Square. And it's a group that got organized after Jeb Bush's administration, which was obviously filled with Republicans in the state of Florida, in the county of Leon County, which is a heavily democratic county because it's got a lot of state workers and it's got a lot of faculty and students from Florida State University. And they found they couldn't talk to each other rationally without going off the deep end uh, and shouting at each other about highways, schools, health, vaccinations, you name it. And so they set up the village square as a place where people could come together and talk to each other and disagree they didn't know they were going to disagree. This is not kumbaya. But they agreed to do it without being disagreeable. And they agreed to meet every month and pick up a different issue every month. And I was invited to come there to talk about economic inequality. And in the main, t and they have dinner. They break bread together. So they're sitting down and eating, which is a good idea. It brings people together. Didn't have too many glasses of wine. And they weren't carrying concealed weapons, as far as I know. <laughs> and, and in the table, the head table, right directly in front of me, were two former members of Jeb Bush's cabinet and two Democratic county commissioners from Leon County. And they've now been doing that for three years. It has now spread to every major city in Florida. It has moved to Oklahoma City. It is in Sacramento, California. And it could be right here in Langley if you wanted to do it. I mean, I think, you know, we're back to talking about what do we do about the media? Well, we go talk to those people. What do we do about talking together? You're raising really important questions. There are things that you can do. And we, we can no longer stop and say, we're helpless. Let's sit down and dope it out. I will bet you, if Marshall Goldberg comes out again and kicks me off the stage, that he will say at some point, you know, I'd like to do this Village Square thing or something like that. You don't have to call it that. You can call it whatever you want. But building and creating forums where people can come together and talk without shouting at each other, without becoming polemicized and polarized, and actually commit themselves to try to solve problems is the way to re-knit our democracy. And it's got to be re-knit from the bottom up. So, uh, where, so my question. You had a, you had a second shot. I actually shot. did have a question. I have so much to say about that. Um, but I, there's going to be a lot of things written about this political season. And I'm curious to know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you could write 15 books on it, but why right now? Why is the escalation happening that both establishments are being taken down, that both of them are go under attack? Um, and why is it coming up now? And I'm talking about the Democrats and the Republicans, sure, sure. both of them. Well, um, let, me, let me be really honest. I don't know, OK? I don't know, but I've got some hunches that I'll share with you, OK? In the first place, it's been going on for about 30 years, as I was suggesting to you. Often problems have to fester that long before enough people get exercised where they begin to band together and people like this young man up here are ready to do civil disobedience. And it's often, it takes that long before some political candidates will start to say, gee, I feel that way and maybe there's an audience out there. So there is something about the fullness of the time they're up. But if you look at the rhythms of American history, there's something there that may give you the answer. 
If you go back to the 1880s and the 1890s, and the, we think of that era as the era of the robber barons, the railroad barons, right? John D. Rockefeller, enormous inequality of wealth. People call it the Gilded Age. It's the first age of, of hyper-concentration of wealth in America, in American history. And it also was accompanied, and most people don't know this, by an by a economic phenomenon called the Long Depression. It built up over a period of about 20 years in the last part of the 19th century. And what do you see at the beginning of the 20th century? You begin to see a move for political reform. The women's suffragette movement start to saying women want the vote. People start saying, wait a second, the railroad barons are picking our senators. We don't want the legislator to pick our senators because the railroads are going to the legislatures literally in Kansas and Illinois and Ohio and all across where the railroads were running, and they were literally picking the senators. Mark Hanna was the big money guy in, in, in Ohio politics, you know. Um, who helped uh, McKinley get elected and so forth. There's a reaction to it, and you begin to see the rise of the progressive era, and then Teddy, Wilson, uh, Teddy Roosevelt starts busting the trusts. You probably don't know it, but the first law passed in America banning corporate contributions in campaigns was passed in 1907. So you see this long period of inequality, and this depletion of the economic growth, and the reaction against it. And then you go to the 1920s, and you see the second great wave of hyper-concentration of wealth in the country. And lo and behold, you get before the New Deal, you get the epic movement in, in California. You get Huey Long talking about sharing the wealth in Louisiana. You get grassroots movements around the country. You get the rise of the New Deal. Here we are now in the third great wave of concentration of wealth in American history and you're starting to see the counteraction. So there is a rhythm to history. Why this election and not last election and not the one before? It's often the circumstances. An incumbent president is there to defend a record that's already there. Some people thought it was going to come in 2008, and we can talk about that on another evening. Um, but, but part of it is the rhythm of history. There is, a, there is a time. I don't think we're done with this. I think when this election's over, no matter who gets elected president, we're going to have to deal with that gridlock government in Washington unless one party controls all three centers of power, the White House, the House, and the Senate. We might then get some things done. But if it doesn't get done, this is going to come back. What's wrong in this country is deeply wrong. It is structurally wrong. And there are too many people who are too unhappy to let it go on. And we're not a passive people, thank God. Thank you very much. Hedrick Smith, everyone. Hedrick Smith. <laughs>